All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started. It's really fun to be able to introduce Lauren Terveen today from University of Minnesota. And we were just uh, reminiscing that we've known each other since 1989. Uh, and that was because we were in uh, kindergarten together. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, yeah, I've seen, uh, watched a lot, uh, Lauren do a lot of different things in his career, working at uh, Bell Labs, AT&T, uh, doing some AI systems. <coughs> Uh, we spent some time together in the knowledge-based and automated software engineering community. And uh, then Lauren has done a lot of early work in uh, social computing with the folks recommendation system. And uh, today we're going to uh, learn about his latest work with Pinterest. Lauren. Thank you, David. Um, well, thanks. It's great to be here while well, I'm having sort of weird echo. Um, and I'm going to talk about some work we've done on Pinterest over the last year or two. And um, let me just start by showing you a couple of pictures from Pinterest. So who here is a Pinterest user? OK, so not too many people. So the metaphor of Pinterest is it's a pin board where you can collect um, resources, web pages. And the way you collect them is you get an image from a site, and that site actually links to the web page or the URL of interest. And so this is a screenshot of the popular page on Pinterest. And um, this is a screenshot of um, my own personal homepage on Pinterest. And so, a lot of food. Uh, yeah, there's recipes, crafts, inspirational sayings, uh, food, recipes. Um, and it turns out the reason I'm seeing that is because what's really featured in my own page is people I'm following. Okay, and I'll talk more about that at the end of the talk. So that's what Pinterest looks like. And uh, if you read about what Pinterest is intended to do, uh, Pinterest says our goal is to connect everyone in the world through the things they find interesting. We think that a favorite book, toy, or recipe can reveal a common link between two people. A very interesting vision. Now, uh, there's sort of maybe a, a little funnier take on this from the Honest Toddler uh, Twitter handle. So Pinterest helps adults organize photos of all the things they don't have. Sounds fun. <laughs> and actually, we'll see, as we'll see later, there's some truth in that as well. Um, so why should we study Pinterest? Um, Pinterest is, I think it's the fastest growing social network in the United States ever. It was the fastest network to reach 10 million users, and I believe it's over 50 million users by now, probably higher than that. Uh, studies show it's a powerful driver for e-commerce. Um, it's also interesting in its function in that the focus is on what we call social curation rather than social networking per se. That is, creating collections, curating collections of things you're interested in, pins in this case of, of images and sites. And then finally, it's also, I think, interesting for us to study because of the demographics. It's a heavy uh, proportion of the population on Pinterest is female. And we wanted to see how does that play out? What are the consequences of that? So um, what we asked in our work is, um, what is Pinterest like? Um, we wanted to characterize and understand it. And a crucial question for any social site is, what attracts attention? What gets your pins repinned, that is reposted? And what kind of behavior or what kinds of characteristics of users leads to getting followed a lot? So we wanted to see about that. Now, we then had to say, well, what factors might be influential here? What factors might be important? What things should we study? And prior research suggested a few things for us to look at. Um, we know that similarity of interest can play a role. Um, you're probably going to be more likely to follow people and pin from people who have similar interests to you. So we wanted to study that. Specialization can play a role. So how specialized is the content that you pin as compared? Are you a specialist? Are you a generalist? And then finally, we think gender could play a role as well. Now, we looked at some specific data on Pinterest. Um, and so I'm sort of going to highlight some of the things we looked at, showing a few typical pages from Pinterest. 
So this is the page for a single pin, which actually, I think, again, it is a recipe, I believe. And associated with that pin is a bunch of information. There's some text. And I actually can't read what this says on my screen. So it says, Sprite and Gummy Bears, very cute and creative for the kids in summertime. OK, so a recipe that might be good for the kids to make. Um, we also get to see repinning. So we get to see who else pinned this particular pin, who repinned it after this person pinned it. Um, we also get to see co-occurrence relationships. Um, so we get to see where else this pin appeared. And so I should say a little bit more about that. Um, on Pinterest, I can create boards. So again, the metaphor is a pin board. So I might create a board for all my stuff about recipes, a board for all my stuff about photography, a board for all my stuff about technology. And so we can see what are all the different boards that this particular pin was pinned to. So we got this information, information about the textual content, repinning relationships, co-occurrence on multiple <coughs> boards. We also got following information. We could see um, who is following a particular person. And Pinterest also makes available categories. Pinterest has a set of built-in content categories, including uh, some of the things you see, including the things you see here. Cars and motorcycles, art, architecture, animals. DIY and crafts, design, and so on. So we got that information as well. We also wanted to get um, people's gender. We could get that from their profiles. Um, and also, um, let's see, we could get some um, people can link in their Pinterest accounts. They can link to other social networks. They can link to their Facebook or Twitter identity. And so from Facebook, this is another way we can get their gender. And an interesting thing we can do is once they link to Twitter, we can go see what do they tweet? What do they say on Twitter? And we'll see why all this information became useful. So to summarize the data we collected and then analyzed, we collected text associated with pins, comments. We collected repinning data. We collected social network relationships, followers and following. We collected the categories of pins. We collected co-occurrence, where a, multiple, a pin may appear on multiple boards. And then we collected information about a pinner's gender when available. Now you might wonder, how did we get this info? How did we get all this information? Well, ideally, we would use the Pinterest API. But if you've ever looked at um, Pinterest and tried to get data, you will find that even though people have been talking about and hearing rumors of an API for several years now, there still is no API. So instead, we had to write crawlers to crawl the website and get the data. There were a number of technical challenges there. Um, I won't go into them here. But if you want to talk about it, we can do that offline. Now in the rest of the talk, I want to go over, uh, give you a preview of what I'm going to highlight in the rest of the talk. I want to talk about an analysis we did that compares Pinterest to Twitter. So we can see how do the different affordances of the two sites lead to different behavior. Um, I want to give you a picture of topics on Pinterest. What's popular? Okay. What's not popular? Um, I'm going to go into the issue of t diversity or specialization and see what role that plays. Again, I'm going to look at similarity of interests or homophily. And then I'm going to close with a fairly long discussion of, well, so we've got these findings. So what does it mean? And what do we think we, we and others should do next? And then sort of cross-cutting a number of these issues is going to be the role of gender, female and male in this case. So let me start by talking about an analysis we did um, with Pinterest versus Twitter content. And we had a few questions we wanted to get at here. How does behavior on Pinterest compare to behavior on other social network sites? Now, we chose Twitter as our foil because compared to Pinterest, we know so much about it and how it's used, and also the data is readily available. 
And so we wanted to see, do Pinterest and Twitter users differ systematically in what they talk about? Now, um, the data we got is from our, well, we crawled Pinterest, and we got a subset of all the pinners who also linked to their Twitter account. So we had 2,600 people who were Pinterest users who also, we could get their data from Twitter. And so we got text for these 2,600 people for 217,000 pins and 737,000 tweets. And so that was the data set we then wanted to analyze. And um, we applied a kind of logistic regression to let us understand what are the words that are most distinctive of Pinterest and what are the words that are most distinctive of Twitter and not vice versa? Okay. And so what I'm going to do is show you a few of the terms, the words that really stuck out for the two networks. So one thing on Pinterest that was very characteristic of Pinterest is DIY. Okay. okay. Another one was heart. I heart this. Okay. So another one. Um, coming back to the uh, picture I showed you, recipe is very characteristic of Pinterest. Old, okay, old is characteristic of Pinterest, so maybe antiques, old things. Um, on the other hand, what do we see for Twitter? New, okay, what's new? Okay, that's what you might talk about on Twitter. And what can you see and now and tonight. Okay, so you're getting a feeling for what's characteristic of the two social networks. Um, Pinterest, old stuff, recipes, Twitter, new stuff, what's going on tonight. Now three verbs really stood out on Pinterest. Okay, three verbs. Use, want, and need. Okay, now coming back to that funny quote I showed at the beginning, um, that Pinterest lets adults gather photos of things they don't have. I mean, there sort of seems to be an, um, an aspect of that, that Pinterest is a way to, to sort of keep track of the things you aspire to, the things you want to do, the things you want to try, the things you want to own. And to sort of further illustrate this point, we built some word trees from Pinterest text. So here's one based on want to. I want to do this. I want to make drinks, cookies, I think it is. I want to try this. I want to be. I want to go. Okay, so those are the common phrases around want to. Need to. I need to remember this. I need to do this. I need to try this. I need to make this. I need to know about. I need to get this. Okay, so these are phrases that characterize conversation on Pinterest. So just to summarize this first, um, first analysis we did, this statistical content analysis shows that these consumption-oriented and aspiration-oriented words distinguish Pinterest from Twitter. So the next analysis we did, we looked at topics on Pinterest. And we wanted to understand what is the structure of topics on Pinterest? What topics are most popular? How are topics related? And then we wanted to see, do men and women differ in the topics that they pin? So for this analysis, we actually did another um, crawl of Pinterest. We wound up with a data set of uh, 46,000 users. Of those 30,000, quite a big majority were female, and a couple thousand were male. Um, and we also wound up then as we got the pins for these people with over 3 million pins. And so what I want to do is tell you about how we came up with topics on Pinterest. Now, um, remember I showed you that Pinterest has a set of built-in categories, um, DIY and crafts, arts, cars and motorcycles, so on. Um, and what we did, we, we explored a couple different ways of coming up with a category, with a topic structure. Um, our paper, and I'll point you to that at the end, talks about those. 
Here I'm going to report on one of those. And the analysis we did here, uh, the analysis that I'm going to tell you about here, builds on the existing categorical structure in Pinterest. And so I put up sort of a, a representative pin structure. Suppose we have a pin P1. Now that pin might appear on a number of boards. And those boards might, each of those boards can be assigned to a different category. And each of these boards, although it doesn't matter for this analysis, each of these boards would belong to a different user. So this board, in this pin in this example, it appears on five boards. Four of those boards have been categorized as food boards, and one is a holiday board. And so we are going to say, if this was all we knew about this pin, we would create a vector to represent this pin. And um, it would be a normalized vector over the whole categorical structure. And we would say the entry for the food category would be 0.8. And the entry for the holiday category would be 0.2. All other entries would be 0. OK, so that's how we came up with a representation of the topic structure for a pin. Now, for users, we can do this. We can build on this by aggregating and normalizing the topic vectors for all of the user's pins. And just as an aside, I should say that this definition means it's a community. This is a community-based definition. And that means, um, given the example I just showed you, even if I would have been the one who categorized um, that pin on the holiday board, if everyone else put it on the food board, we would be inclined to say, well, you have an interest in food as well as holiday because the community as a whole believes this is, uh, this is related to the food category. So that is an assumption of what we did. So the next thing is we can report what are the most popular topics on Pinterest given our sample. And so here's what we found. Uh, the most popular topic is food and drink. Next most popular is DIY and crafts. After that, home decor, women's fashion, other, or uncategorized, weddings, design, hair and beauty, art, kids, photography, and so on. Okay. So fairly straightforward, but an interesting characterization of here's what you see on Pinterest. Here's what's popular. Next thing we did was a cluster analysis to see how do these topics relate to each other. <coughs> And again, it was, it was interesting. And this is a case where I felt like it confirmed our intuitions. But since we didn't build this in a priori, it was really fun to see it. So weddings and holidays and events are very closely related. Food and drink is closely related to them. And then home decor, um, hair and beauty, women's fashion, photography and art, um, geek and technology. Um, Sports, men's fashion, cars and motorcycles, tattoos and technology are close to each other. So again, the way that people pin and co-pin uh, content on Pinterest seems to reflect a pretty intuitive set of relationships between topics. Now the next thing we did is said, well, you know what? Let's actually look at how men what is popular with men on Pinterest? What do men pin? And what do women pin? OK. And so we have a diagram where, uh, in this graph, the bars going up show uh, the popularity of a topic among women. And the bars going down show the popularity of a topic among men. And I believe, if I remember right, in every case, or almost every case, there's a statistically significant difference between these proportions. That is, every topic is either significantly more or less popular among women than among men. So you can see food and drink. Um, that accounts for a little over 20% of all the pinning activity of women, a little over 10% of all the pinning activity of men. Uh, DIY crafts, also much more popular among women and men as is home decor. On the other hand, you get to something, um, let's see, what is this? Oh, uh, other, uncategorized, that's not very interesting for us. But I think design is more popular among men than among women. Um, 
what's this next one? Um, art is more popular among men than among women. So we saw those differences. Now another thing we noticed is, and I want to use this phrase very advisedly, what one might think of as stereotypically male uh, topics, like maybe technology or sports or cars and motorcycle, um, these are much more popular among male painters than among female painters, but they're not the most popular topics among men either. On, uh, men on Pinterest are much more interested in food and drinks and um, home decor and um, design and art and photography than they are among these topics. And so I want to come back, I'm going to come back at the end to why those things may be. Yes? Could it be that men and women categorize the same content differently or put different content in the same category? Is that maybe one of the explanations for this? Or? <clears throat> Maybe. Uh, that's a good thing for us. That would be a good thing to look at. Um, we can do that analysis. So I'll put that down as a good thing for us to do next. Did, did you by any chance compare these to these, the uh, declines to state category or whatever it was? That were unspecified. To, to you had male what? and female and unspecified, which was seven times greater than male, it seemed like. Um, 2,000 as opposed to 2,000. Right. We did not, we did not do that comparison. I think we just sort of felt like we didn't, you know, yeah. we didn't know the makeup of that, so, yeah. I'm just wondering whether it would track closer to one or the other. That's a good, yeah, that might actually let us assign, you know, attribute, attribute that. Okay. You're digging out secrets. Here. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, obviously, you, you probably know there's work showing that you can, you can identify the gender of people pretty well from text online, so, yeah. Okay, next thing we looked at was topical diversity. And what we wanted to know here was, to what extent do users specialize in particular topics? Do men and women differ in their degree of specialization? And um, how does specialization and how do other factors play a role in attracting attention, specifically attracting followers on Pinterest? Now we thought it would be interesting to look at diversity because prior work um, in the Twitter contest context actually disagrees as to whether being more specific and concentrated in the topics you post on or being more diverse is going to be better or worse for attracting attention. So we wanted to see how does it play out in, a, in um, Pinterest. So we, we measured diversity in a standard way using entropy and then one sort of obvious thing is we, uh, we wanted to group users by the number of pins because obviously if you only post a few pins you can't be very diverse compared to somebody who posts you know, many, many pins or pins a lot. So, um, and indeed that's what we saw. So um, the more you pin, um, by the way I think we divided our, our data set up into 10 equal size bins, that's what's being reflected here. Um, and so the more you pin, in general, the more diverse the topics that you pin in. Now, um, I then, what I have next is a, a table that is going to show two things. It's going to compare how diverse men are compared to women, but it's also going to show you the specific numbers for everyone, for men and women, um, in these different bins. And what I can tell you is, I'll, I'll just sort of make the point I made before, um, there, every one of these bins is, as you go down, each successive bin is statistically significantly more diverse until I get to here. Now these are indistinguishable. So in general, until you get to super prolific pinners, diversity increases. And then with two exceptions and one partial exception, um, women are more diverse in their content than men. So the very most and the very least prolific pinners, there's no statistically significant difference between the diversity of men and women, and then this is marginally significant. But every other, ca every other bin, women are more diverse in the content that they pin than are men of the same prolific 
this, okay? So the next thing we wanted to do is to consider this issue of um, diversity of content as one of the factors when we looked at how to predict how many followers somebody on Pinterest would have. So again, we did a regression, we figured out how many, uh, or we did an analysis and we figured out, or uh, we wanted to see what features would predict number of followers. And um, up at the top, we have three features that were pretty prominent. How many other people you follow, if you follow a lot of people, you tend to have a lot of followers. And if you have a lot of pins and a lot of boards, you get a lot of followers. So if you're socially connected, that helps. And if you pin a lot of content, that helps. The red things are content features. So it turns out if you pin on popular topics, you have a lot of followers too in general, that helps. And then finally, topical diversity actually says, it turns out if you are more diverse in what you pin, that plays a role too. It contributes to getting more followers. It is about as helpful as pinning on some of the more popular topics. Okay, so to summarize what we saw, having more followers correlates with following others, being an active pinner, posting on popular topics, and being diverse enough. Okay, and what does that mean? So what it means, or why do we say that? So we did this further analysis where we looked at sort of the marginal effect of diversity. And what we found is, don't worry about the um, numbers on the axes, but what we found basically is, as you got more diverse, you tended to have more followers, but when you got too diverse, the effect wore off. And we don't have a deep um, analysis beyond that, beyond what seems like an intuitive interpretation that um, if you're too narrow, it's not good, and if you're too diffuse, because people aren't interested in you. And if you're too diffuse, people sort of don't know what to expect from you, so it's probably not worth following you either. That's our speculation anyway. So there's a, a Goldilocks uh, plot there. You gotta be not too diverse, not too uh, narrow, but just right. Okay. Next thing we did, um, let's see, our final analysis that I'm gonna report on, we wanted to look at similarity of interests. And we, we looked at this because as we were looking at some work that came out about the same time as we did our first piece of work, there was a suggestion that um, people were most interested in content that they cared about rather than socializing. And we thought maybe if we looked at how similar people were to people whom they followed and how similar people were to people whom they repinned from, we might see a bit of a difference. And so we said, well, let's check both of those kinds of similarity. And so we used cosine similarity between users' topic vectors. Remember I touched on that earlier, how we created the topic vector for users. And we, we used cosine similarity to measure uh, similarity of interest between users. And what we found is that um, two things that were sort of obvious, yes, users repin from similar users, and yes, users tended to follow people who were more similar to each other. But in our analysis, what we found is this relationship of repinning, being similar to people you repin from was much stronger than the uh, tendency to be similar to users whom you followed. And here again, um, I'll take you back to um, the first picture I put up, or the, one of the first two pictures I put up from Pinterest, where I showed you um, my homepage on Pinterest with a bunch of recipes and kids' crafts. The reason why is when I joined Pinterest, um, it helpfully suggested to me, okay, I'll step back. It helpfully suggested to me, hey, do you want to follow any of your Facebook friends who are on Pinterest? My Facebook friends who were on Pinterest were my nephew's wife and a lot of her relatives and sisters and so on. And they were people I was somewhat connected to socially. I don't share that many topical interests with them, but the way Pinterest was set up, I followed them, and now I'm seeing information from them 
even though I'd be less likely to repin from them. So again, we sort of speculate that might be why we saw a difference in the strength of these two types of similarities. So let me talk about um, what this means and what we think could be done next and what we're intending to do next. So perhaps one of the most interesting things and compelling things to think about is, you know, why are these differences um, between men and women on Pinterest? Um, why do we see different interests in, uh, first, why are there so many more women than men on Pinterest? And second, why do they pin, um, tend to have different topical interests? And third, why are the men on Pinterest perhaps not as interested in, let's call it again, the stereotypically male topics as one might presume? And so when I tried to understand this, I actually went and read a bunch of popular literature on Pinterest. How do people talk about Pinterest online in the popular social media? And so I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you some portraits of Pinterest. And so here's one from Slate. Uh, Cupcakes, boots, and shirtless Jake Gyllenhaal. If you like any of these things, you should be on Pinterest. So how do you feel? Do you want to be on Pinterest? <laughs> some do, some don't, right? OK. Um, so here's another one. Um, oh, I guess this is actually from the same article. So the guy's writing and saying, the guy is writing and saying, there's only one problem. I just don't get it. I understand the basics. Pinterest is a graphical social bookmarking site, a way to show off cool images you find online. So notice he's understanding it in terms of the techn technological affordances, graphical bookmarking. Cool. Um, and then he says, if you're into pictures, especially of fashion, home decor, food, and animals, you should stop reading and sign up right now. And notice those were very popular categories on Pinterest. So he's sort of right about it. And then um, he goes on to say, I suspect that my problem with Pinterest is that I'm just not that into pictures of fashion, home decor, food, and animals. Most of Pinterest users are women, and the pictures that greet you when you visit for the first time show off stereotypically feminine pursuits. Now, my point in showing you this is to illustrate this is what people who don't know about Pinterest are hearing about Pinterest. Okay. Here's a, maybe a cruder th thing from BuzzFeed. 57 reasons why guys are scared of Pinterest, uh, which they actually illustrated by showing 57 images from Pinterest that they said would scare off guys from joining Pinterest. Uh, perhaps descending further down the ladder of crudity, uh, Pinterest is Tumblr for ladies, okay? Uh, quick, name the most perplexing social site you can think of. If you are a dude, it's probably Pinterest. Um, now, this is interesting because it's coming from a different um, perspective. This is a woman writing about it on a, a progressive site on salon.com, if, you know, if you're familiar with that. Um, and she's talking about Pinterest, and she says, well, Pinterest says we can connect everyone in the world through the things they find interesting, but when you're enticing people all over the world to redecorate your home, plan a wedding, find your style, and save your recipes, you might as well announce, guys, it's like when she takes you towel shopping at Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> Now, this is another interesting article, a social network of one's own, okay? And so, a um, bunch of things here. Tech guru De Deanna Zant pointed out to me that Pinterest first attracted housewives and crafters, and its image as a women's site stuck. And an interesting, different perspective on it, she credits the label as a factor in keeping the space safe. And then, Notice this framing of it. Even the site design subtly signals that men who bring a lot of baggage about sex and gender should stay away. And then she says something. I'm not sure I can perceive it this way. The banner is curly and pinkish. And I think that just reads as girly to a lot of people, says Jill Filipovich of Feminista. Hence, men are not using it as heavily. Um, and then I like this. So this is a, a positive gendered. Um, 
or at least positively framed perspective on Pinterest, the pink and girly exterior of Pinterest works as a jerk force field, keeping the most piggish men away, leaving pinners to indulge their interest in peace. So again, the perspective here is that um, the people who are attracted to Pinterest are not going to be the people who are like, you know, dragging their knuckles on the ground, the Neanderthals, I guess. Instead, they're going to be people who are more interested in art, home decor, etc., whatever it is. Now, so threatening or so, uh, uh, so threatening is this image of Pinterest to men that you may know there's a bunch of Pinterest clones out there, Pinterest for men. One of the most uh, uh, unsubtle one is mantaristic, okay? And, you know, here's, here's a nice one, a woman. If more sane people were armed, the crazy people would get off fewer shots. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, the mantaristic users were sharing. Um, another sort of silly man-oriented image. But what I probably like the most is that on man resting you don't pin content, you nail it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those are some of the things out there in the literature. If you read about Pinterest, and undoubtedly this has formed people's impression of Pinterest, that creates an identity, an image of Pinterest, yeah. That kind of apropos the question that was asked earlier, maybe people who aren't specifying their gender are men who don't want to admit their men on Pinterest. So maybe so. And um, I'm going to come to this in a minute. You know, I think what I've reported here is all quantitative data analysis. And what I'm now doing at the end is trying to speculate as to why things might be the way they are. How do we find out about that? We have to use different methods, qualitative methods. And we are just starting to do that. So, so what else might it be? So it might. So I think one thing that might play a role is who is interested in coming to Pinterest, who makes it through this image or impression that they receive of Pinterest. But the next thing is, remember the site. Remember what my homepage looks like. OK, here's what my homepage looks like. So, um, and this is after I've used Pinterest a little bit, at least. So for me to be interested in Pinterest, I basically had better be interested in um, recipes and crafts, okay? Because otherwise, I'm not seeing much of interest to me here. That's the picture that I'm getting. Okay. So actually, we are starting to do um, a qualitative study on Pinterest. I've got two students who are just starting to do this work. Actually, they just got their uh, interview up. We're doing an interview um, where we're actually recruiting via Mechanical Turk. And we're trying to reach both people who have used Pinterest and people who have never used Pinterest. And we want to understand, focus on people's perceptions of Pinterest. How do people conceive of this site um, if they have not used it and know about it, or if they have used it? And if they haven't used it, we actually want them to sign up and see how that process goes and what they make of it. So we want to look at a few things. We want to look at how people perceive a Pinterest compared to other sites. How do people articulate what you do on Pinterest and who is on Pinterest and what is Pinterest for compared to Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or Instagram or whatever else they use? How do people understand who Pinterest users are? Here I was sort of informed by a study uh, Judd Anton did of how people perceive of Wikipedia editors. He did this, I think, at Kai a couple years ago. And it was funny because, uh, as I recall, the, the two things that were most prominent in my mind, people sort of imagine Wikipedia editors as really smart. And they also imagine them as sitting in their underwear in their parents' basement. So I'm not quite sure how those two things go together. But those impressions that people had of Wikipedia editors really led a lot of people to decide, I can't be a Wikipedia editor because I don't fit in that. So we want to also understand, how do people perceive or what are their impressions of who are Pinterest users? How do you compare to other pinners? Um, 
And then two things that I think go really strongly together that I alluded to before. Um, when you sign up for Pinterest, you're invited to sign up using your Facebook account. Many people do. And then you get presented with a list of your friends on Facebook who are also on Pinterest and are invited to follow them. And it's very easy to follow them. And so we want to understand if people sign up with Facebook and they use this, how does that influence their impression of Pinterest, what they see and how they perceive the nature of the site to be, and what are their initial impressions of that? So as I said, we're just getting that um, survey up right now. So that's the work we're doing. Now there's a few other things we think that would really, that really deserve attention. One is a more detailed analysis of topics on Pinterest. So you notice that I showed you some of these top level uh, categories on Pinterest like DIY and crafts. But there's a lot of different DIY stuff like woodworking and scrapbooking and DIY jewelry making. And I think if you can distinguish those different subcategories, you're now starting to have the basis for um, reaching people who have different interests on Pinterest. And to me, I think this is probably, if, if I were at Pinterest, or if I could get people at Pinterest to do some work, I would say the best thing you should do is to start on doing better personalization and doing it earlier. Um, so we saw our findings showed that having the right amount of diversity in front of people is helpful in general. Um, I also think emphasizing categories of information to people, especially these finer grain categories, could help. So if Pinterest could know, if Pinterest could act on a knowledge of what categories, what types of information I'm interested in and what I'm not, that would help. I think the model of having um, your initial user experience shaped in large part by content from those you follow, especially if it's imported from Facebook, it probably doesn't seem to me to be working all that well. So I'd instead prefer some more personalization thing, a collaborative filtering thing. And then perhaps the final thing that I would recommend um, is really quick personalization of content. And there's sort of a, a tension here. So if you go to a traditional recommender system, I just did this with Goodreads myself. I signed up again on a new device, and also like our movie lens system. The first thing the user forces you to do is tell you explicitly, what do you like? You know, rate some items, tell me some things you like. And then the system can give you very quickly content that you like. Okay, now that's good. If Pinterest would force me to do that, Pinterest could tell me things that I was interested in, could tell you things you were interested in. On the other hand, I have to go through this explicit process of telling Pinterest my preferences, telling the system my preferences. I think in this case, my recommendation to Pinterest would be explore this. See how lightweight and painless a process you can put in place to get people the right content quickly. So I'd like to see, not man interesting, but me interesting. What's interesting to me? And I think Pinterest has the ability, the potential to do that. So to summarize, um, our findings, what we found from this work is that um, men and women differ in the type of content they pin and how diverse they are. Being diverse in the type of content you pin means more followers, up to a point at least. And we found interest similarity is a powerful driver of repinning and following, but to a lesser extent. And then finally, I should say, um, I started out by showing you that people who both pin and tweet, people who are pinners and Twitter users, talk about different things and use different types of language on the two sites. Um, those are the two papers we've published on Pinterest so far. We had one in uh, CHI 2013, one in CSCW 2014. Um, my collaborators were my students, um, Sho, Stephen Chang, and Vikas Kumar, and then Eric Gilbert at Georgia Tech, and his student, Sayadea Bakshi. Um, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions.
just thinking another way of maybe understanding that is, is it possible that the sites that were interesting for men were already out there? And so it's not that like, it's like Pinterest was filling a missing need rather than it necessarily you know, repulsing men or something. So that's, so I think to some extent that's true, but you have to understand that at the right level, which is, um, this notion of social curation or pin boards or collecting stuff, that doesn't feel, so you would have to presume that that is gender, that men are not that interested in doing that, that men are more interested in you know, posting stuff on Reddit or you know, stuff like that as opposed to collecting information. That's the first thing. Um, and I'm not sure, I mean, maybe that's true. The second thing is you'd have to wonder about why people have started all these clones of Pinterest for men. I mean, they must think there's a chance to succeed that, oh, look, Pinterest is popular. Men aren't going to Pinterest, so therefore I'm going to try an, a, a site that has the same model, uh, and yet it's sort of oriented toward men. So maybe, but I'm not sure. Well, apropos that, I suggest a different kind of study, which is to get a large sample of <coughs> just a cross-section of people who use sites of any kind and look into why they have chosen the ones they've chosen. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, one of the things that doing this work has got me really interested in is studying, I, I guess, the larger ecology of social media sites and online communication. And by that I mean, um, why do people choose to use one or the other? How do people choose to use multiple ones? And then how do they um, distribute their activity across the different sites? What do they think you know, Pinterest is good for? What do they think Twitter is good for? What do they think Facebook is good for? Why do they choose to do one thing on one site and one thing on another? And how do they share stuff, connections, and content across the sites? Um, you know, most studies have been single site studies. We did this one study where we looked at Pinterest and Twitter and you know, trying to understand the broader ecosystem and, and the connections between sites and how people use them, I think is, I mean, I think that's the next frontier. That's the way you have to go now. It was just occurring to me, I, I think possibly more grandmothers show photos of their grandkids than grandfathers do, and maybe women possibly buy more magazines than men, and there might be, I'm just curious about that. So I, I don't know if that's true, I mean, and that seems like a good thing to look at. I mean, and I have heard people speculate that women just enjoy the images, collecting images more than men. I don't know if that's true. Uh, anecdotally, I, I have a colleague, I, I can't see him at all without him whipping out his phone and showing me his you know, one-year-old grandson, but I won't, maybe we'll consider that the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. Lauren, have you thought about trying to come up with more nuanced categories than men and women? Um, because it seems like there must be something more going on. There must be demographics, regions, social classes, something because like I wouldn't I would hate going to Pinterest myself, and I think I'm still a woman, but um, it seems like you're sort of evading those issues and using these really course categories that are not capturing what I think you're really trying to understand. I, I would largely agree with that, and I guess um, I think I would probably put it differently by saying I think probably, it seems to me that the analysis we've done is a good start, but you have to go deeper. And, um, you know, by trying to understand why you know, what is it about Pinterest that attracts certain people and doesn't attract other people? Um, I think that's my handle or my framing of trying to get at the same thing. But I agree, this is just, it's an initial stab. Um, it was quantitative data we could get from Pinterest. I think we've, to understand these issues, we've sort of hit the limit of what we can do with quantitative data. And now we need to go into 
uh, qualitative methods to get at those kind of issues, and that's what we're starting to try to do as well. And I would, uh, I would encourage other people to do that, people who are much, um, what would I say, much more fluent in uh, qualitative methods, because I think that's what we need to get at those issues. Um, no, we don't, and that's actually a fascinating question as well. I, I'd sort of forgotten about this, but we, uh, we have started to, um, another thing we started doing just this last month or so ago, we started collecting tweets that actually mention social, other social networks, including Pinterest. And the intention is we want to see how are people tweeting about Pinterest. Um, are they sharing pictures? Are they sharing images from uh, links to Pinterest? And then what are they saying about it? What are they sharing there? So yeah, I think that's a whole nother interesting uh, way to go. Now, one other thing that I didn't say, which is sort of obvious, and I think a few other people have started to do this, is what, what's Pinterest ab about? It's about pictures. And video. And video. Okay, we didn't analyze the actual content, the pictures and video, and so, because uh, that's not our expertise, frankly, and so we'd have done a, not a great job of it. And so we think there's just all kinds of opportunity for people to actually do content analysis of the images and, and the, the actual content. Did you happen to analyze the actual images to see how many of them were repeats? Like, because I know a lot of people are repurposing the same content over and over. We didn't, and that actually turns out it was kind of hard to do with the data we could get from Pinterest. So the point is, so let's take an example. I think uh, an example I gave when we were collecting the data was uh, uh, Gone Girl was popular then, the book, and uh, great book. And then anyway, you think, well, let's see the, the uh, progression of this book, how people pin it. Well, it turns out, you know, there's not a single tree where a person pinned it and then everybody else repinned it. Instead, many, 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 many people are pinning and then it gets repinned from many different sources. And furthermore, if you think about that particular thing, some people are pinning from Amazon and it's Gone Girl. Some people are pinning from Goodreads and it's Gone Girl. And some people are pinning from the author site and so on. So it turned out we kind of gave up on that because it was a little hard to do, but again, another fascinating thing. What, what about like the different types of pins, like the places pins and the geotag? Have you looked at those? I haven't looked at those at all. Supposedly in the UK, um, Pinterest is popular with men, and it's also supposedly more upscale. And I don't know if it's a network lock-in, women got there first, and then that's why they're bigger here. Yeah, we, we hadn't looked at that. Our, we didn't look at that specifically. I think we weren't able to get enough data to do that analysis. We did one analysis in our first paper that looked at geography, but when we crossed geography and male versus female, we didn't have enough data to do much. But yes, um, in the UK, I think it's 55% men or something. Um, and I haven't been able to find much of a story about why that is or what the differences are. But yeah, I think that's something worth looking at. And last time I checked, Pinterest really was popular in the United States and maybe a few places in Western Europe. It hadn't gotten popular in other parts of the world yet, at least last time I checked. You already asked the audience the question I wanted to ask you, which is how people decide and find the time to devote to so many different uh, sites. Like some of the people I noticed on your site are also active on uh, Google Plus, but I chose Facebook and I don't have time for Google Plus or Pinterest or others. Any, anything you've come across about that? Um, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I feel like there are people who just are extraordinarily social, who want to be active everywhere. I think there's people who are um, professionally, they want to see what the sites are like, and so they try different things out. So, I mean, our, our friend Cliff Lampy does that. I mean, he has to try every site. Um, for me, I tend to try one or two, and then 
I'll tend to be most active on one. I, I was active on Twitter for a while and then I sort of gave up and now I do much more stuff on Facebook and then there's a few other sites. I just monitor occasionally to see what's going on but I'm not really active. Now I think I did see a study recently that suggested, and again I can't remember where I heard this little fact, that most people actually are only active on one or two sites. I don't know if anybody else came across that. Basically Facebook and maybe one other is, is what it is for many people. But it, it sounds to me like you're at the beginning of a huge, long data mining activity just to find the relationships and the clusters, the correlations and the clusters that will lead to development of theories to <coughs> explain some of the causes. It's that, that, remarkable and it's, a, it's not just one particular discipline, there's a lot of different ones that you have to bring to bear. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think Obviously, we use a lot of techniques from data mining and statistics and then uh, computer science to get the data and then all kinds of things to, um, you know, try and make sense of it. But, uh, I mean, I think in a way I would come back to what Bonnie asked me. I, I think the thing, you know, we started this work from very much a quantitative data analysis point of view, but I think um, now to... I'm, to understand more deeply the things that we've, we've, we're have we seeing as potential patterns, the things that are being hinted at, um, we need different methods, and we probably need um, more theory as well, more conceptual theory. Well, that's like a really good question to end on, uh, needing more theory and more research. <laughs> <laughs> and more funding if any of you people are in the audience. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll have a, just a couple announcements, but uh, so don't bolt out of your chairs, but let's thank uh, Lauren once more. Oh, yeah.